one I'm officially recording. And let me get my little chat window back and we will begin. Okay, everybody, tornadoes. So uh, from owner, who's owner? Let's make sure you have your name. So let me just remind everybody, have your name on here so we can give you credit. Welcome to the third in our little series, and uh, hopefully we'll keep it going even after number four. Number four will be in two weeks. And um, <clears throat> a couple of housekeeping details. Uh, if you want CEs, we need to get an evaluation back from you. So Nikki's been trying to keep everybody, get back to everybody and send evaluations. When we get your evaluation, we'll send you uh, your CE certificate. If you want an ASIC certificate, that is a different certificate. So you need to let us know that you need an ASIC certificate, okay? And uh, that's that. So um, go ahead and um, feel free to ask questions, to chat. And ah, Beth, okay. <laughs> so just Beth, um, if you click on the top right, um, move your mouse around, rename yourself with your name so that Nikki will know it's you and can give you credit. And um, sorry about the tornadoes. Okay, so today uh, we're gonna get right to it. Hopefully everybody can see my screen that says Addict America for Lost Connection, Dr. Carol Clark. Everybody sees that? And I can't see you, <laughs> so you'll have to chat. You can all chat or unmute and just say, yay. And this is kind of a follow-up to two weeks ago when I did uh, Intimacy and Connection and Recovery. Um, okay, so you can see me, but can you see the window, the screen that says Addict America, The Lost Connection with the cover of the book, right? That's what you want to see. Okay, because that's the beginning of our PowerPoint. And what we're going to talk about today is expanding, uh, you know, the, the other workshop was Intimacy and Connection and Recovery, and it was looking at how addiction forms and how it's used to avoid intimacy and how can we get back to, um, get back to, um, there, oh, I made myself bigger. Oh, but you don't want me too big because you want to see the screen, right, never mind. Um, <clears throat> squirrel. <laughs> A little ADD thing going on there. Um, what I want to look at today is, uh, again, we're going to look at this idea of addiction being part of everything. And, uh, you know, problem, it, it causes these problems with connection, the lost connection. And we're going to look at how this addiction concept can plug into so many problems that our clients present us with. Okay, so this is me. A lot of you know me now. So I'm Dr. Carol Clark. Uh, here, I will make this available to you. So these are all hyperlinks. If you want my book, Addict America, The Lost Connection, <clears throat> my pocket therapist, 12 Tools for Living in Connection. Uh, great. I'm the owner and president and uh, Chief Cook and Bottle Washer of the International Institute of Clinical Sexology, Therapist Certification Association, uh, International Transgender Certification Association. So if you're interested in taking any of our programs, getting a PhD in clinical sexology, or just getting certified in sex therapy, uh, addiction, transgender care, sex offender therapy, kink therapy, hypnotherapy, uh, please, please call me, come see us, visit our website. And there's my bug for comic relief because, and I put in a picture of the bug this time. How's that? That's my bug. Um, in case you thought I was lying. Here's this quote from John Don that I really love. This is great when you are starting a group. Any of you who are doing groups, this is a wonderful icebreaker or discussion um, point for your groups. This idea, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. 
Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So this is from a time when there were small places where if someone died, they'd ring a bell, the church bells. And in these days of COVID, we can just imagine how many bells would be ringing. The, so what would happen is somebody would send a servant or a child or somebody, go see who's, who died. I hear the bells tolling, go see who died. And this is saying, never send for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So in these times, we're all connected and everyone's death diminishes us through that connection. The power, what happens in addiction is that we become disconnected. So we're gonna learn about, and just kind of expand on this idea of addiction being a barrier to intimacy, being a barrier to connection. And the fact is we are all connected. We can't not be connected because we're part of the grid. We're part of the Higgs boson, which is a unifying field of which we're all part. There's an energy field in the universe and we're all part of it. But what happens is we become disconnected in our lack of awareness of that connection when we shut it down, when we're so focused on feeding something inside ourselves, on trying to get something we think we need, that we, we, we put up that barrier and we don't acknowledge our connection to others. And we do this on such a and such a continuum. So if you think psychopath, serial killer, that's the real extreme of someone who's so disconnected, they lack all empathy, they're not even capable. But on the other end, we do this every time we get angry with somebody, every time we don't listen to somebody, every time we want our own way and shut out even our loved ones. Okay, so that's, that's what, that end of the continuum is what we're looking at. We're not, we can't do anything about the psychopaths, but on this end of the continuum, we can help people come back into connection and empathy. So <clears throat> I hope so far this is resonating with you. And feel free to, to put your comments in because I'm looking at two screens, I can see all your comments. And uh, it's nice, I can't see your faces, so it's nice to know you're out there. <laughs> And again, addiction in my world, Clark world, is not about being addicted to something. We're addicted to stimulation, if anything, and then we just choose drugs of choice, and the drug of choice could be technology, it could be my phone, and I disconnect when I'm looking at my phone. If I am... Um, Somebody at home, do me a favor, I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt, but um, Mindy Clark, could you send uh, Jennifer Lopez and uh, Esther Jimenez uh, the link for today's, for this workshop, please? Or just put it on TCA so that they can get it. Thank you. Uh, so this idea, every time, if I'm looking at my phone, and people make jokes about it all the time, they're sitting out to dinner and people are on their phone, disconnected. Um, so we're doing it all the time. And that's why I really want to get away from this idea of drugs and alcohol or even gambling. And <laughs> of course, sex is, um, you know, sex is this huge controversy. We have a lot of uh, CSATs who have been taking my classes and all, and they get it. But even the, you sex therapists, sex, uh, sex addiction therapists, I'm sorry, the sex addiction therapist, and with all the controversy that goes with sex addiction, let's step out of that and look at it. It's about addiction. And you all know this, that we can really embrace the idea that it's not just about sex. It's about addiction overall. And <clears throat> when we look at people who come into our offices with problems with intimacy, with relationships, and we start viewing it, even if they don't present as having a problem with addiction, we start viewing it through that addiction conceptualization, that addiction lens, it resonates for people. It works. 
And the beauty of it is then the recovery part of it works to help them with whatever issue they came in with. So some of those issues, I apply it to anger, compulsive working, shopping, use of technology. One of the things I really want to get back to because I had uh, a couple of new clients this past week, last week, with anger issues. <laughs> and a lot of you may get uh, work with people with anger issues. When you look at anger as addictive, so somebody um, type in, if, if any of you out there approach anger issues through an addiction conceptualization, um, pop it in. So um, Martha, meanwhile, is talking about sexual compulsivity. So the thing is, Marcia, uh, Martha, sorry, Martha, um, my problem with using the term sexual compulsivity is then it makes it about sex. I have a compulsion to do something sexual. And, you know, I have a compulsion to masturbate. And then we're looking at fighting the compulsion or changing the compulsion or relieving it. There's overlap there, but it's still putting the focus on sex, which honestly, a lot of the anti-sex addiction people say they have a problem with. They don't want to pathologize the sex. So when you use the term sexual compulsion or sexual compulsive disorder or something, um, yeah, you can still say it's about the compulsive nature of it. But that leaves out the whole process. And when I talk about addiction, I'm talking about a whole process. So someone who's, say, just compulsive, has a, it's, it's based in anxiety. Compulsive disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders are based in anxiety, unless they have an actual brain anomaly. So it's... There could be overlap. In fact, if everyone wanted to switch over to obsessive compulsive disorder in the sense of, um, you know, changing it from addiction to that, then I would say we would need to change everything. And it would then become alcohol compulsion disorder. It would be gambling compulsion disorder. It would be, you know, cocaine compulsion disorder, you see? So right now we already have a framework that using the addictive, uh, the addictive framework uh, encompasses everything. It, it encompasses recovery, this idea of recovery that is so much more than just abstinence, so much more than just not doing a particular thing or not using something in a compulsive way. So I'm always happy to talk more about that. And, um, and maybe we'll even do a workshop about that. So put it on your evaluation and we'll do an even broader talk about that. Um, and uh, Emily is saying, I have not the anger, Penny, halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, Martha's saying, got it, but people are scared of anything addiction as out of control. Well, yeah. That's the thing, it is out of control. Of course, addiction is out of control. The, the, the definition of addiction is obsessive in my world. So this is all me, okay? Obsessive, compulsive, out of control behavior done in spite of negative consequences, self or others. Now you could say, okay, that, that could apply to compulsive disorders. If I'm compulsively looking at my phone every five minutes, okay, that's out of control. So, all I'm saying is, if we are going to make that shift, let's just not make it about just sex. Let's make it about everything. Okay, I'm there. I'll, I'm, I'm flexible. <laughs> I was just doing uh, my workout this morning, Qigong, I'm very flexible. Okay, but for the most part, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, in the sense of the terminology, addiction just works. People kind of know, people use that all the time. So, uh, there we go. And we can always talk more about it, but uh, we only have an hour today. So I want to move on and, and we can leave it at the end, possibly. Um, so the idea of anger 
I want you to kind of be thinking about anger. Also, what I want you to be thinking about today is our political climate, our corporate climate, the state of being in our country, in our world, and how addictive a lot of it is. We're going to get to that. So for me personally, I'm coming from my life. I just got this slide in here from the old days. I was the center of the universe. I was a child of uh, an alcoholic. Then I became a counselor, then addictions professional, sex therapist, sex addiction therapist, educator, author. And here we are. So these are, that's, that's me in a nutshell. And um, we don't have time for this. This is just a message that when you read my book, this will make sense. So here we are. We are a nation of addicts. Obsessive, compulsive, out of control behavior done by negative consequence self or others. Definition of addiction. What makes us all addicts? Well, here in America, it's who we are. We pride ourselves on this shit. We pride ourselves on being go-getters, on being individuals, on being doing more and more and more. Just as an example of addiction and codependence, they're, they're hand in hand. And I know a lot of people are getting away from the term codependence, but it's when, just bear with me. For instance, the government shuts down. The government, our government says, any government, I'm not talking about any particular political thing here. The government says, we're going to shut down. We can't balance the budget. We're going to shut down. And what happens? All these Americans, God bless them, they step up and say, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep things open. We're going to work without pay. There's an example of codependence. They enable, enablers. We enable the government to get away with their addictive behavior. Okay, so wrap your head around that. That we enable the government. And we take pride in that. We take pride in it. Because there's something admirable. There's, there's a sense of connection. Like, I don't want people to suffer. I'm going to go to work so the park can stay open so people can come to the park. And there's, there's that paradox. Like, we're, we're connected. We want to do this. But there's also an enabling, addictive process going on in that, that way of thinking. So a lot of today, I just want you to think about things differently. Um, here's my, here's a one minute video. The sound is gonna come through your computer so you can adjust the sound to suit you. Our American lifestyle has become a state of addiction. Cell phones, fast food, internet shopping, gambling, and pornography have replaced personal interactions. Our culture doesn't even realize there's a problem. This is about waking up to the realization. I didn't mean for that to freeze. ...that what we think of as normal is unhealthy. We've lost our connection to each other in our striving for stimulation. With awareness and awakening, we can begin to change. There's a different way to live, to find fulfillment from within, not from without. This book offers simple yet powerful new ways to communicate in all relationships. We can learn how to truly connect with others and to be present in our daily lives. We can recognize our addictive thinking patterns and learn how to shift to a place of recovery with a renewed sense of hope, well-being, and connection. Addict America, The Lost Connection by Dr. Carol Clark. Um, sorry, I was trying to mute myself, but then I paused the video um, so that you could hear. <laughs> so that was, that kind of sums it up, and I hope you can see how that maybe goes beyond um, the idea of compulsion, just something being compulsive. Yeah, sorry about the echo, that's what, yeah. You can go back and look at it without the echo. So <clears throat> part of this video, we're talking about what, waking up the realization, what we think of as normal is unhealthy. And that's the Addict America piece. So there's a lot of stuff that we Americans do. We work hard, we play hard, right? Those are things we pride ourselves on. Work hard, play hard. We have a history in the past around alcohol, being able to drink somebody under the table. Well, all that means is you have a really high tolerance. Um, just work, work, work. 
and um, gambling and, you know, other countries, they look at us and they say, what are you nuts? You know, other countries, they take an entire month of August off for relaxation. They have sick leave, they have maternity leave, they have all kinds of things that value the individual's ability to relax, to be present, to just kind of keep balance in life. And Americans typically don't have that. So we work when we're sick, right? One of the biggest things now is with the whole coronavirus, but even any other time when there's in flu season or anything, it's why people stay home, you know, because there's, it's not just the money part, which is ex extreme for some people, like they have to work. They just can't afford to take a day off. And we don't pay people enough for sick leave. We don't pay them enough, period. But there's this idea of there's something weak about me if I take a sick day. You know, I have to power through. So that kind of thinking is what I want you to, to kind of be aware of, be aware of how you do it, <laughs> be aware how your clients do it. So then you can look at it from this addictive framework because now we have a way to approach it and a way to work with it. So credit card debt, a lot of people are just buying, 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 buying. More things, more things, more things. Yeah, those with a dysfunctional system don't recognize their normal is not normal. Yeah, and that's why it's, that's why I called the book Addict America, because our whole system, the American system, is this way. But this is, you know, I'm, I'm holding this up. I hope, I just like to spread the word. To, like, no, it doesn't have to be normal. And it's not normal for our brains because when I talk about the brain, I'm talking about the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. And the limbic system, which is 5 million years old and has been chugging along, doesn't like change, that normal is balance, got to eat, got to procreate, got to, you know, stay warm at night, you know, get a roof over your head have social needs, human beings, we've kind of woken up to have some creativity, but there's a lot of balance in that. When the system gets out of balance, when we start getting inundated with more stimulation than what the limbic system, the five million year old limbic system is accustomed to, that's when we go into addiction. That's when we reset the baseline. We're going, uh, I think I have a slide for that. So think about traffic. You know, for those of us like me who don't go out very much, I don't have to commute. I just drive five minutes to the classroom when I'm in the classroom. The rest of the time I'm here at home, um, even in non-COVID times. Uh, when I have to go someplace and I see the traffic on the roads, it's just, it's insane. And yet for the people who are in it, that's become their normal. So yeah, that's what's normal. But it's, it's not healthy. Just because we've gotten used to something doesn't mean it's healthy. So 12 hour work days, credit card debt, pushing deadlines. Anyone, any one of you who says, oh, I work best under pressure, sure you do. Because that's when your limbic system is in high alert. It's an addict mode. When, you, when that becomes your normal of having to be under pressure all the time in order to produce, that's an addictive process. It's an addictive process. Road rage. You're driving in your car. This gets to the, think about the serenity prayer. I'm just going to be throwing a few just bits of ideas at you. Think of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity, accept the things I cannot change. I cannot change the traffic, right? I can't. Okay. Accept the serenity, accept things I cannot change. The courage, change the things I can. That's me. So what do I do? I can, I have a choice of how to respond to the traffic. I can sit back listen to a book on tape, kind of sing to myself, use a little quiet time to let my brain just, you know, think about daydream, you know, get be creative. Or I can rage against the traffic. I can, ah, damn it, damn it. And there's your difference between addiction and recovery. And this is what I want you all to look at. And it's really easy for us as therapists to fall into our client's way of rationalizing their addictive state of being, their addictive thinking and behavior and feeling. Because they come in and they say, oh man, it was just so hard to get here because of this traffic and blah, blah, blah. 
Now I could easily enter into that and say, wow, you're, yeah, of course I know Miami traffic. But, or I could say, how is it that you didn't allow yourself enough time? How is it that you didn't just relax and enjoy the ride? You know, how are you creating the stress that puts you in this addictive state? Okay, well, who's that? Okay, so we have, um, Power and control, and this is where I want you to think about CEOs of big companies. I won't name any specifically, or politicians. Again, I'm not gonna say anyone specific, because there's so many, there's so many. You know, there's some obvious ones, and then there's plenty of others. But when you think about the head of a company that is getting more and more and more and more and more, has billions of dollars and won't pay their workers a living wage, won't pay health insurance, won't give them time off. And for what? Okay, that is at the heart of that addictive process where I need to prove that I'm good enough. I need to feel good enough. I need to feel worthwhile. I need to feel lovable. And the only way I can do that in my head, my addictive brain, is to be grabbing more and more and more. But that's the that's the problem, serenity prayer. It's never going to be enough. I can't, every time I reach for something external to fix something internal, that's addictive because it's not going to work and it's never going to be enough. And so all those billions, you see some people, some people like Bill Gates, I'll, I'll name the good ones, right? You get somebody like Bill Gates, he appears, I don't know him personally, but he appears to love what he does. He loves what he does and he happens to make billions of dollars out of at it and then he gives it away because he's not trying he's a happy guy he's just a happy guy inside he doesn't need to prove anything but you get these other people they're not giving it away they're they're just amassing more and this happens with our politicians it's they want both the money and they want the power you know and when i look at some of our politicians who are already millionaires and billionaires and yet they have to keep they have to keep pacifying and trying to get the sense of self-worth from big corporations to the detriment of the people in their jurisdiction, whether it's a county, a state, a country, that you know, it doesn't make sense. And here's where, when something doesn't make sense, when it's irrational, when you're saying, why would they do that? The answer is addiction. They're addicts. And I'm telling you, that works. That works so much. Um, Marnie down there, uh, you, you're talking to me privately, so it looks like you're sharing a book, so you might want to set your chat to everyone. All right, so overworked, overstressed, overweight, overindulgent, all, anything over is about addiction. And our addictive brain starts out with that message learned in childhood for, you know, even, even well-meaning parents can screw up their kids. You know, the kid comes home with a report card and says, oh, I got to be in math. What do you mean you got to be in math? You can do better than that. Um, Kathy, uh, stay muted, please, so that, because you're going to pop up on our uh, recording. The you know, that parent, and it's not just the report card, everything, the parent might think they're being motivating, right? But they're not. What they're telling the kid is, you're not good enough, you're imperfect, and there's a sense of being lovable, of being not lovable, of conditional love. You know, I'm not gonna love you. Parents don't realize that's the message they're getting, giving their kids, but, but it is. So I'm a failure, I'm a bad person, I'm worthless. And that leads to a fear of intimacy. And when you have a couple come in, or any permutation of that, um, they're going to have problems with intimacy communication. And as a sex therapist, and anyone who wants to be a sex therapist, um, see me, <laughs> call me. Uh, we get a lot of people, sex therapists get a lot of people who come in to see us saying they have a sex problem. And nine times out of ten, I haven't actually done 
right on the statistics, but there, there's a good uh, research uh, for some of you. Um, nine times out of 10, it's not about sex. Sex is a symptom. It's really an intimacy connection problem. Two weeks ago, I was talking about you know, intimacy and connection and recovery, and I have those uh, article links, so I'm not gonna talk too much more about that. But sex is the symptom. People are trying to be sexual in order to feel intimate, but that's a dead end. And so one of the first things I say to people is, let's work on the intimacy, let's get you connected. And then whatever you do sexually will be fine. And it doesn't matter whether you have a, you know, an erect penis or a lubricated vagina or you're doing it this way or that way or have an orgasm or don't have an orgasm. It's all good because it's an expression of intimacy. It's an exp this is how we're connecting. Even, and I'm not just talking, please do not think I'm saying that everybody has to be in some kind of monogamous, you know, committed relationship. No, 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 no. Because you can have, you can be with someone for one night, for one moment. But if you're feeling connected, if you're present, if you're fully with this person, then it's gonna work. Then you, whatever it is you want, it's gonna be fine. But it's when you're in these you know, one moment relationships, <laughs> trying to get something, trying to heal something inside, trying to feel connected and thinking that sex is gonna do it and orgasm is gonna do it. And then it's a dead end. And then you need more and more and more and more. And there is sex addiction. But stopping the sex, you know, being abstinent from anything is not the same as recovery. Abstinence is simply stopping one particular drug of choice. There's plenty others. So we have, we're all on a part of this Higgs boson, the force, the cycle of life, the tree of life. I got my, Nikki made me these, got me these little earrings. They're like the tree and the circle, that's my thing. Um, the, we are connected and when we, we distance ourselves, when we don't acknowledge that connection, we're gonna suffer for it. And that's addiction prevents intimacy, but it also forms the, uh, it becomes its own thing for preventing intimacy. So we reach for drugs to relieve that pain of disconnection, and then they become the reason for the disconnection on top of whatever else it was. So our enlightened brain, the prefrontal cortex, is able to say, I yearn for connection. All, I, all animals do want connection. You know that if you have a dog <laughs> or a pet. You know, we all want connection. But the, uh, it's human beings that come up with all these problems with connecting and these fears. And that's why at the end I talk about my dog. But here's the limbic system, caveman brain. Caveman, just because that's a generic term, please don't assign gender to it, even though it looks like it. Um, the limbic system is just that basic primitive brain that everyone has. We share it with, um, you know, we share it with everybody, every living thing that has a brain. But it's the enlightened brain, the prefrontal cortex that can recognize, can say, I am connected. I want to be connected. I am, there's something greater than me <clears throat> that can say, I love you. So connection is an innate ability. We are born able to connect, unless of course there was something in our past, which actually is pretty interesting because in the past, um, we're, they're doing more research now that shows that we can carry, I don't know, seven generations, maybe more of memories of our forebears uh, that affect us now. So there's another level of connection there that we're connected to our ancestors through our memories. But we still, we still have an innate ability to connect. And uh, so to be disconnected is a dysfunction. It's a dysfunction of our true potential. And here's just uh, a couple of fun 
<laughs> not fun for the people involved. But the uh, still face paradigm with Edtronic, that was when the mother and the baby were making eye contact. And I can tell you, here's a, a fun little thing that you can do in these days of COVID when you're meeting people online. If you look into your camera, so I could, I'm not going to do it too long right now. I'm just going to look into the camera, make eye contact with you. You're not making eye contact with me because number one, you're not on my screen and I can't see you. But I'm looking at you and if you're looking at me, it appears that I'm looking at you. And if I stop talking and just be still and maintain this for about a minute, you're going to find your autonomic nervous system is going to relax. And if you do this with your clients, do it for a minute. I'm not going to do it for a minute because <laughs> we, have, we don't have that many minutes left. If you do it with your clients through the camera, you'll have a real sense of connection with them. And you, the therapist, it's up to you to connect with them, to help them feel connected. But you'll feel it too because just the awareness, I'm looking at this artificial eye, and yet when I stop talking, and I'm aware that you're there on the other side of that camera. I slow down. I can feel it. I can feel it. So yeah, Porges and the polyvagal theory and connection. So there's a simple little exercise that you can do to start your sessions with your clients, even when you're doing them uh, telephonically or electronically. So <clears throat> the still face paradigm, it's about that I can, you know, of course, if you're visually impaired, there's other ways of doing this. But this is built into our brains, into our limbic system to connect. And you know how this one ended up, that when the mother looked away and the baby kept trying to get the mother's attention and eventually the baby got very agitated and then the baby shut down. And the mother re-engaged quickly and then the baby, you know, came back to life. But when you have people who shut down and because they're being neglected and abused and they don't get that chance to come back, then uh, they're going to be, they're, they're damaged. They're going to be damaged. And, you know, we've, we're going to try and heal them. We're going to try to heal in a lot of different ways. But the damage is there. You need to acknowledge that. And then you had the monkey <clears throat> Harry Harlow's monkey experiments. And on the one side, you had just a wire that gave the monkeys food. But on the other side, you had a cloth that was very warm and snuggly and no food. And the warm, snuggly monkeys grew up to be pretty happy and healthy. They got food, but no warmth and snuggliness. <clears throat> Sorry. They grew up to be very uh, antisocial. So these things are programmed into our brain. This connection, this need to connect, feel connected. So here we have, again, sex, gambling, computer, texting, stress, anger, work, anything you can think of. In my world, Clark conceptualization of addiction, anything can be addictive. If you're reaching for something external to fix something internal, and then you keep doing it, you do it and do it, you're gonna become addicted. And I guess that could be something else with your compulsion, because if you're looking at compulsion as more of a brain disorder, whereas addiction is something that's learned and reinforced. And it just carries so much more emotional weight. I guess that's another thing. The compulsion, we use the word compulsive disorder. To me, just to me, it doesn't carry that, all the emotion, all the trauma, everything else that went into how people become addicts. So we would lose all of that if we switched over from that to that terminology. Here's a neat little graph that's, um, I keep trying to make more uh, aesthetically pleasing, but. <clears throat> if we assign numbers, and I didn't randomly assign these, I read them somewhere, but don't ask me where, please. Coca leaves. So here, when I was talking about, um, you know, the, the caveman brain, the basis, uh, five million years old, how things have been working. We have coca leaves, 
barely register, maybe a 25 if we're going to assign the number. Cocoa leaves give you a stimulation level of 25. What we do in our modern times is we intensify everything. So we intensify cocoa leaves to become cocaine, and now it becomes a 200. And the caveman brain doesn't like that. Orgasms. Orgasms, a little bit more than 25, maybe a 50, whatever you want your orgasms are. <laughs> okay. Methamphetamine is a thousand. Okay. This is what we're putting into our brain. And the, the caveman brain doesn't like that. It says, no, no, no. We need to maintain the status quo. So it raises the baseline. And this is where what's, when we were talking before about what seems normal now, but it's not really, it's not normal in the natural world. So traffic, it becomes normal because your brain has reset your baseline to how much stimulation. So if you look here, if you think about those coca leaves, um, cocaine, if, if your brain sets 200 then as baseline instead of that zero, then cocoa leaves, orgasm, aren't even going to register. You need cocaine just to feel normal. And then you're going to seek out more cocaine. You're going to seek out methamphetamine. You're going to seek out other drugs of choice. And if normal is at 200, then that's your simmering point. That's, that's what feels normal. So that you need that much stimulation just to feel normal and that's where the anger that's where the technology that's where the work that's where all the the drama all these other things are constantly in your life procrastinating getting road rage all those things are keeping you normal to where you need something even more to feel stimulated to feel pleasure okay does that make sense to everybody and this is what we've done so this is kind of at the heart of Addict America. We're addicts because we keep resetting what is normal to us. And we've done this as a nation. <clears throat> so here's just some uh, brain chemicals. You can always go back to this slide to look at them. But these are all the brain chemicals that have to do with stimulation. And these are what's impacting that limbic system. So dopamine, of course, the feel-good chemical norepinephrine, enkephalins, adrenaline, serotonin, all of these things work on that addictive process. And I'm not, just to go back to the compulsion thing, I'm not sure how many of them actually, you know, work with compulsive disorders. So hoarding. And I got to tell you, for somebody that works, here's the, here's the difference between my limbic system, my prefrontal cortex, right? I can work with sex addicts. I can work with a lot of things. I can work with sex offenders. I can work with a lot of people doing a lot of things. I can work with all kinds of addiction because I know with my prefrontal cortex, I know the addictive process. I've seen it. I've lived it through my father, through a boyfriend, through all my clients. Okay. I know what happens. I teach this stuff all the time. Right. So I know it. And yet gamblers and hoarders, my limbic system has a problem. It's just because of my own nature. You know, I'm really cheap. <laughs> I don't want to, I'm not cheap. And then I overcompensate. I try to be really generous. But when I go into, once in a while, I've gone into a casino or when I see a TV show or a movie and see people gambling, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, the idea of wasting that much money, throwing it away, <clears throat> just my thing. My thing. So there's plenty of other people who specialize working with gamblings. So I know, but I have that limbic system thing. I acknowledge it. It's good to have that self-awareness. And hoarders too. You know, I just have this, I'm a little bit messy. I might be a lot messy. And then I kind of get to that point where when I watch that hoarding show and I do watch it. <laughs> and it would take, it, it just, I get it. I get it. So, um, and yet that that's uh no i'd be in there with the <laughs> the shovels so but yet and and i can work with people that other people can't work with so i think we all need to um just uh acknowledge <clears throat> that what what's what pushes our buttons 
the uh, sugar, artificial sweeteners. Um, <clears throat> and maybe I could do some EMDR on myself about it if I had to and find out where that comes from. I could probably do that. Because if anybody's into being in recovery, I'm going to be there to help them, no doubt. Sugar, artificial sweeteners. Did you know, talking about that intensification thing, artificial sweeteners can be up to 600 times sweeter than sugar, than cane sugar. Did you know that? How many people knew that? So <clears throat> the marketing in this is just amazing because, you know, so every one of you, I know it's, I know who you are. <laughs> the, uh, and our clients and everybody in America who's reaching for giant diet sodas and all the time, what it's doing is it's training that limbic system brain to crave more sweetness. And so how are you going to do that? You might have the one diet soda, but then you're going to be craving so much more food. You're going to be craving carbs and you're going to be craving sugar, anything with sugar. And so now your, your eating is out of control because you're resetting your brain. So if everybody just goes back to cane sugar, just a little, you know, teaspoon of sugar, just a spoonful of sugar. Okay. Uh, so do your little bit of sugar. And for sweetness, use some honey, use something else, but not the artificial sweeteners. And if, you know, and if you want to say, oh, but what about stevia? Or what about the, okay, look at it and, Find out what's the number, what, how much sweeter is it than the natural sweeteners that we find in nature that our limbic system, our 5 million year old brain is geared to respond to. So with artificial sweeteners, we have both a chemical craving set up. And then of course we have the <clears throat> comfort food. We have the behavioral aspect of uh, eating. So anyway, path to addiction, internalized negative beliefs about self. When you're working with, say, someone who has an anger problem, I got this guy coming in now that has a rage problem. And, um, you know, what we want to get to, what's his negative belief about himself? I'm worthless. I'm not important. I'm not good enough. Leads to the pain of disconnection, fear of intimacy. And then, of course, being angry is certainly going to keep people away. The stimulation of the anger, the stimulation of drama leads to escape. Now I feel better. And people say, how can I be addicted to something like anger? I don't feel good when I'm angry. Well, I beg to differ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's not like, woohoo, I'm so happy today. It's not that kind of feel good. But in the dopamine reward system, it feels good. And look. Doesn't it make sense that if something feels good, we're going to do it again? If something doesn't feel good, so if I start stabbing myself in the head with this pen, that doesn't feel good until maybe, you know, actually our nervous system, eventually it would feel good. But because that's the way the limbic system works. And Right now, if I stab myself in the head with this pen, I'm not going to do it again because it doesn't feel good. But something like anger, it does on some level, it feels good and you do it again. And then it's hard to stop. And then think about a time when you felt angry and somebody might have been saying, calm down. You might have been telling yourself, calm down. And then part of your brain, I certainly, this has been me, say, hell no, I'm not going to calm down. Right? It doesn't make sense and things don't make sense. And you say, why do you do something that doesn't make sense? The answer is all at once, addiction. Addiction, right? So we talked about mood, line, mood baseline being artificial erased, constant need for stimulation to feel normal. So anger, if you're being angry, if you're being anything, uh, and it's a constant state of running late all the time, a constant state of hyper arousal, then um, that feels normal and that's addiction. And just, okay, so some of you asked, I'm just going to kind of run out the clock here because <laughs> I wasn't sure how long all my slides would take. So when people are 
doing this argument against sex addiction, like having sex addiction, has to be a drug or has to be this, that, that. The thing is, the DSM has always, in its last, you know, going back, DSM-3, maybe the two, I don't know, the two was before my time. Um, it's always been about behavior. It's always, the criteria has always been about behavior. So it's about leading to, watch, stay muted, everybody. It's about um, behavior that is clinically distressing. Okay, so here we have, this is from DSM-5, taking more than you intended, that's the out of control part. The persistent desire to control or regulate it and you're not able to, that's also about control, it's out of control. Um, spending a great deal of time, more time than you wanted. You know, you spend five hours online, whether it's gaming or porn or whatever, and realizing and, and saying as you're doing it this is bad for me i'm going to regret this tomorrow morning i know this isn't good right it doesn't matter whether it's alcohol or if it's gaming or what it is right um and then the dsm-5 introduced craving which i think is going to be an opening for sex addiction but the craving you want more i gotta have more the social impairments unable to fulfill major Role obligations, interpersonal problems, uh, giving up certain activities. Okay, that's all behavior. That has nothing to do with whether or not it's a phone or it's sex or it's alcohol or cocaine. Risky use, same thing. You're doing it instead of, and then your tolerance and withdrawal. And they used to say, well, withdrawal. Okay, that's our, that's our thing that you know there's no withdrawal from sex of course there is you talk to any sex addict in withdrawal it's about and it was the same thing back in the 90s when people were in 80s when people were trying to say well cocaine's not addictive because there's no withdrawal symptoms okay stay muted <laughs> um there's no withdrawal symptoms and then i don't think there's anyone today that's going to argue that cocaine's not addictive um so the addictive personality, Desiree, is, you know, just if you're an addict, okay? So we can get away from the personality like this is something that you were born with, an A-type personality. It's more that you're an addict, that you have that need to escape from the negative beliefs that you're living in disconnection and it causes pain and you're reaching for something to make yourself feel better and it's never gonna be enough. And so you're just go, 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 go. So that addictive personality, I would now categorize as someone who's simply an addict. And the drug of choice is immaterial because it's gonna be anything can be a drug of choice for an addict, okay? So, it's simply all of these things. If you substitute a particular behavior and, <clears throat> you know, I did this originally and I think Pat Carnes did as well. So kudos to Pat Carnes, um, you know, where he went through the DSM diagnosis uh, criteria and substituted sexual behaviors. But we can go beyond that and substitute any behaviors. Okay. And so these are all things that you can do with your clients, and we're gonna stop with that. We made it through there, so now I will. <laughs> I will um, stop it there and uh, give, we have two minutes for questions or comments. You can chat or talk to me, and I see somebody said ASD. Are you talking about um, um, Asperger's, uh, aut aut um, autism? Right, autism spectrum disorder. I knew that, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, autism is obviously, you know, there's going to be other things and maybe we'll do another workshop about that. So if you put that on your recommendations for the evals, I'll do a, an hour where we talk about how the overlap and how one thing can look like another. I'm happy to do that. Yes, it will be online. I'm going to leave this with this thing showing, um, we got some fun, more things here that are fun, but um, I'll make that another, another uh, workshop. So, cause uh, 
And I'll make a note that we made it through criteria in one hour. So we'll do another hour. Anybody want to come back for another, keep going with this? Yay, thank you. Okay, then we'll do it. <laughs> well, okay, we have people who want to come back. At the end here, you can check these. Here's just in this idea of connection and recovery. All, I found all these people that you know their names who, you know, talk about that. Um, in fact, I think, don't I have two? Okay. Where's my picture of Sammy? Anyway. Okay, so we'll, we'll do another workshop on this. So I'll keep them on my notes to work. Questions, comments, and um, remember if you, if you ask a question, it will be on the recording because then I'll see you. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna do? I know what I'll do, I know what I'll do. Wait, always, always the way. I'm going to... Uh